Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Monique Bosch, a co-founder of Westport's Green Village Initiative, a nonprofit grassroots organization working towards a sustainable future. Monique has been active with environmental issues most of her life and has served on several boards in Fairfield County over the past 10 years, including the Environmental Action Group at the Unitarian Church in Westport, the Environmental Justice Network in Bridgeport, and the Green Task Force for the town of Westport. Five years ago, she also started a community-run CSA with Stone Gardens Farm in Shelton, building up the membership to its present day total of 180 members. She and GVI are actively involved in building edible gardens at all public schools in Bridgeport, and the organization is about to break ground on an urban farm in that city. Monique, welcome to Stream of Conscience. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Green Village Initiative, uh, a Westport organization which has begun to spread throughout Fairfield County, and you uh, and Dan Levinson co-founded it several years ago. Along with Liz Milwee and yes. Sherry Jagerson. So and the four of us began the, it. The four of you began it. And what was it that you had in mind when you started Green Village Initiative? We really found that there were better ways to do what we were doing, which is living in this earth. And, and um, we really felt that there was a community of people doing different things with different organizations, but they didn't really seem to have a cohesive, um, I guess you could say a power base, mm -hmm. because we were all sort of doing floundering on our own. Um, Dan Levinson, who um, is the owner of Main Street Resources, had an office, he had funding, and the passion to really get involved. Um, so the four of us came together and started this with something that's unusual for, for grassroots, especially environmental groups, um, to have funding behind us. Right. And to, to have the support of the staff, of offices. So it, suddenly we found ourselves able to take ourselves seriously as a group. And with that, a lot of people from other organizations came and the whole motive was to be action-oriented. I think in addition to being action-oriented, uh, it seemed to me that everything was organic, if you will. It, it, it wasn't uh, an organization that was led by anyone who said, this is what we're going to do, here's, here's the, the menu of things we're going to do this month. It was, what do we want to do and how can we make it work? We really did our motive was to find tangible goals, mm -hmm. things that could actually be accomplished, not just talk about them, not just preach or, or complain, but we really wanted to do something. And so we tried to find those types of um, projects, mm -hmm. and we did. And, and the Edible Garden projects, for example, were the ones that really had such a positive spin because suddenly we weren't just complaining about how things were, we were saying, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to change it. It's a positive thing, and people just got enthusiastic. And so you started off with edible gardens in the public schools in Westport. We started with the Staples High School Garden, okay. uh, the edible garden there. Um, we helped host a edible gardens in schools symposium at the Unitarian Church about that, almost three years ago, and that really was the start of this community in Fairfield County saying, we should do that. Mm. There's no reason why we can't learn again to grow our own food, to bring it into the school system, and really start, talk about grassroots, everything that you eat. Where does it come from? Why does it have to travel 1,500 miles? How can we get back to taking control over what we eat and how we grow it? And having better food for the kids in the schools in particular. Well, we've had Amy Kalafa on, on the program, and uh, uh, recently we had uh, Benny Boyd and Erica Miller mm -hmm. come on with the Westport Food Revolution. So there are lots of people now who are working on these issues of bringing good food to the school so that the kids learn what it is to eat right. That's right. So we're very excited about now branching into Bridgeport, uh, where our promise was to put an edible garden at every school, all 30-some schools. Uh, this past spring, we put in nine gardens at schools, um, as well as one at the public library in Bridgeport. And uh, we would have garden build days on a Saturday, and 70, 80 members of the community, including teachers and students, came to help us build these gardens. 
and it was so much enthusiasm, so much optimism in making these gardens real and, and so, teaching them. So describe a garden. What, is, what does one of these edible gardens look like? Well, they, they vary depending on the site, but they're all raised beds. We find that that works in terms of the, the mo most production. Mm -hmm. Raised beds with just regular wooden frames around them seem to be the most efficient. Mm -hmm. um, in Bridgeport, we put up a lot of chain link fences because that was efficient uh, use of space. And uh, we brought in soil. Uh, Sal Goberti from uh, Goberti's Herb Farm supplied the soil. Right. And so we started with very rich, organic um, soil to mm -hmm. grow the food, which is really the most important thing. Right. And then um, some of the seedlings were started in the schools with, that knew that they were getting these gardens, and, and Sal Goberti also donated a lot of seedlings. And that's what we did. In, in one day, uh, for what was an empty site um, next to a school became a garden. Mm. Now, did you have uh, much difficulty working with the school administrations to find the space, to agree to let you put in the things, to put up the fences? Um, you know, I mean, I, when I think of school administrations, public school administrations, I of, often think about people who are used to saying no to people from the outside that they sort of want to control everything themselves. Well, I've never been, and it's been heartwarming to see the enthusiasm of the teachers, the principals, um, and the students. They're so excited mm. to see this grow, the, the food growing, and, and in fact, they had a big celebration. We had put a garden in, la actually, another one last September, and by October, they had a special salad day uh. where they harvested all the lettuce, and the, the entire school were in the auditorium having this big salad feast. And that's the sort of thing that, to see that kind of support, and now there are after school programs with the stu students and some of the teachers, um, teaching the kids and, and really going through the seasons with the kids. But now the kids aren't in school during the summer, which is usually when things are growing. So how do you handle that? Well, this is something, this is, talk about learning curve. Um, the one thing we found this year was there was a lot of food ready to go in July, August. And, yeah. and rightly so. <laughs> so what our plan now is to start the gardens growing very early in the season and do a lot of spring um, crops mm -hmm. like spinach and lettuce and peas, things that will be harvested before the kids leave. Before the end of the school. That's right. And then our hope is to work with the kids to do a summer planting mm -hmm. before they leave or maybe with um, some of the students that stay in the summer. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and plant for fall crop. Right. So we're really going to cater it for the school system. So you would have a spring crop that would be harvested in mid-June at the latest. Right. And then plant something else that would be coming up in September, October, and it could be used then. That's right. Rather than growing a bunch of tomatoes, which come out in July and August, and we'll just start them later. Just start them later, <laughs> yeah. right? But now, who takes care of the of the uh, of the crops during the summer? Because you've got to have. I mean, I do a bit of gardening, not nearly enough, but you you always have to be weeding. You have to make sure they get watered. Um, Sometimes you have to prune them or stake them or, you know, yeah, they have to be taken care of. It's not, they do. They can't just be growing. So who does that? This past year, Groundworks Bridgeport um, got a grant to hire local students from the local high school in Bridgeport to maintain the gardens. And what is Groundworks in Bridgeport? Uh, Groundworks Bridgeport is a group that um, maintains a lot of the things in the, the, the city puts in trees. Um, in fact, they put butterfly gardens at a lot of the schools. So this was a natural thing for them to take on. Okay. Uh, they had a van. We took one of our spring interns who helped build some of the gardens. Um, he was a driver. And they went around to every school all summer long maintaining them. And it was a wonderful program. The students were really engaged. We had a few from Fairfield, um, another one from Westport that, that helped on uh, when they could, so it was a it was really a a fun group that and then, had and a, then students from Bridgeport as well. They stayed the whole summer, right? And uh, really had a huge impact. And I think that that was a wonderful model. We hope to keep getting that grant. And I can still remember that the one of those days I, I tagged along, and we ended up harvesting I think 150 heads of lettuce. Now what do we do? And the uh. school had got, had closed unfortunately. So um, oh, said the custodian, there's a um, an 
a, a home for the aged just around the corner. So we all went there with our bags of lettuce. Then a bus came to pick people up, and we're on the bus handing out lettuce. It was that sort of spontaneous. There was an incredible uh, outpouring of um, gratitude right. from people receiving this lettuce that had never been seen before in those neighborhoods. So nine schools those this past spring. Yes. And you're going to expand to the remaining uh, 36 schools, or there are 36, I think, altogether in Bridgeport That's of right. various sorts. And so they're all going to get a garden. Yes. And how much does one of these gardens cost? Because uh, you know you well, must be doing yeah. fundraising, and you must be must be getting you know lots of donations from people. So we are. So talk and about the economics of this, if you would. Well, ironically, the first garden we put in at Staples High School was $25,000. It was very nice. It's a large Irrigation, right. the special patio steps and things. Um, but it now was we're for doing Staples, them. So yeah, right. <laughs> now we're doing them for $2,500. $2,500 for a garden. That's right. And, and, and we're getting a lot of the lumber donated. Okay. Um, the plants. Uh, uh -huh. we're, we're actually starting a lot of our own this year. Right. Um, the wood and um, the uh, fence was, we found someone who would do it at a very reasonable price. And of course, all the volunteers, Builders Beyond Borders, it's a talk about an incredible marriage there because they have students that need community service hours locally. So they are coming out to all of the garden builds and be making a huge difference uh, working with the community to build these gardens. So, and Builders Beyond Borders for people who, who haven't known about this group before are, are local kids in high schools um, throughout this this area. This area I, yeah. I know that they're in, in Staples and Greens Farms Academy, and I'm I'm sure they're in Fairfield, Fairfield, other yeah, organizations, uh, other places around, and they raise money during the year and go off and do a trip generally in the spring. To, to places like the Dominican Republic or Guatemala, where they do service work. That's right. And they have to raise money and, and pay it for it themselves. But in addition, there also is a community service requirement for all of these kids. And so that's where you come in. That's right. And they have been incredible, hardworking, and it's a, such a feeling. They have their own community. Yeah. And uh, have been working. Some of them, students, have been doing it for a number of years. So there's a real camaraderie there. And I think they feel so much gratitude and such a need, really, for, for this kind of interest in Bridgeport that it's been very well received on both sides. Now, you've had in Westport a very loyal following of volunteers, people who've been involved in all kinds of things for you. And, and, but now uh, you're branching out, and I think there's a GVI, Green Village Initiative, in Ridgefield. Is that right? That's and, right. Tell, tell me, how is it that you, you, know, you network beyond and, and build that community? Because there's so many um, volunteer organizations that kind of you know, flounder. They, don't, they can't really reach critical mass, but it seems like you've done that. I think the key is that we've been very open to say, if you are in Ridgefield, in Darien, and you have something that you really want to make happen, Come and talk to us, and we would love to work with you. Mm -hmm. And I know Claire Carlson, for example, who runs the Ridgefield GVI, they've already put an, an edible garden at every school there. And she is really a mover and shaker, and all we've done is sort of help her along the way. We did a, a film lecture series. Um, she did it there, and now Darien, uh, the bag ban is being, being done in Darien by Deepika, um, who's done an amazing job. And so I think there are... Again, people in various places doing the work, and now they have a group behind them supporting whatever they want to do. So it's empowering them, and I think that's what really makes it work, that we're all sort of on the same track. And so the more we can help each other and work together, the more it strengthens the, the entire movement. Now, I mentioned in the intro that you uh, established a CSA, but I didn't say in mm -hmm. the intro what a CSA is. So what is it? That's called Community Supported Agriculture. And it was something that anyone can do. Uh, you can just say, you know, I'd really like to get food directly from farms. Mm. So uh, we wanted to do that in our community a number of years ago. So we found a farm who we said, would you grow food for us? And they said, well, we, don't, we, we need a mass of people to do it. We don't really know how to start this. So we had 32 people. We said, well, look, we're a group. We'll start. And so that's how it began. And so what we did, we paid it up front, 
I think it was $600 for a full share to feed a family for, for the year. So that $600 meant that we got a box of whatever was harvested that week from mm -hmm. the farm from the beginning of June till the end of October. Well, okay. what a great idea. Right. You're not only eating as fresh as possible, what's just been harvested, you're supporting the local farmer, mm -hmm. and you really are learning about a lot of food that you wouldn't necessarily buy yourself. I, I think a lot of us around here don't it. even realize that there are, in fact, working farms. You know, really? I mean, there are working farms here in Connecticut and not that far away. That's right. Uh, but, you know, you, 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 we've, we've lost touch. We think of food coming from supermarkets, and we don't know where that comes from. You know, I mean, any place that you can buy strawberries 12 months of the year, it, obviously they're not grown here. Yeah. Um, and not to mention the, the food tastes incredible. If right. it's local, grown, fresh, and it's the healthiest way to eat. Right. And the best thing about this model, unlike a grocery store where I think 40% of it is thrown out, nothing is wasted. So generally we eat what's in our box, but if there's anything we don't like or we're, we, we're not going to eat it, um, whatever's left the next morning goes to the food bank. And they've come to rely on us knowing that that food is coming every Friday morning. Mm. And so then the soup kitchens come and they'll get the freshest food. So this whole system it's really that's what the community it really is community support agriculture because the community is supporting the farmer is supporting whatever is grown and making use of it and beyond food because edible gardens and CSA you're, you're doing everything in the food business what else is group GVI working on uh, we're doing some water initiative mm -hmm. um, we were actually taking a local watershed in well, it runs from um, Norwalk through Westport. Um, there's actually two, um, the Weston Westport one and the Norwalk, Wilton Norwalk one. And we're, we're studying it and finding ways to educate the local community, um, including the people that are, are working in those, uh, those um, neighborhoods, um, the importance of or the effects of pesticide use and, and herbicide and runoff mm -hmm. and um, lawn practices and garden management that will really um, help the aquifer there and talking to people in areas that, that have the highest impact on the aquifers. Um, we're also doing more film lecture series. This is a, uh, we've been doing those for a number of years, um, which is really education. Um, and um, the bag ban we're supporting um, in whatever town wants to do that. Da uh, I know Darianne is very heavily involved with that. So those are some of the areas that we're working in. And so the bag ban was a, a ban on, on plastic bags in stores in Westport, and it's been in place now for over two years. Yeah. Uh, two and a half years, I think, it's actually been in operation. Um, and if you go to the Stop and Shop or to the, you know, any of the stores, uh, you have a choice of uh, getting paper from them or bringing your own bag, which is, I think, what most people do. Um, it's really, it's just, it's been a bit of a gradual, it's not like you wake up one day and everyone's using their, uh, <laughs> their own bags, but you, I'm sure if you were to come to Westport, you will notice that everyone, just as a matter of fact, now carries the bag right. with them. So it, it's good to see this fundamental shift in our consciousness. And it's the sort of thing that, that again, this was started by four people in Westport. Liz Millowy mm -hmm. was one of That's them right. uh, who helped found uh, GVI. And they got it through the local RTM and figured out how to implement it. And it's, uh, it works really well. I don't think people, uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem. When you go to a CVS in Westport and they have paper bags and you go to Subway in Westport and they have paper bags and you yeah. go to those places in other towns and they still are using the plastic. So um, the two lessons, one of which is that Yes, they can change, you know, and, and secondly, it didn't cost them a lot of money. I mean, it didn't put them out of business by any means. They're still there. They're still making money. That's a perfect example of taking a fundamental thing that we either take for granted or not even are aware of what we're doing, right. our actions, and making that shift, and it does ripple through, I believe, our whole way of living, interacting with each other, of really having respect for are where we live and, and how we live. And what is it that brought you to all of this to begin with? I mean, you know, what has motivated you to get involved? Personally? Yes. I think it's my love of nature. 
uh -huh. that that feeling that I have that um, that I'm not separate, that I'm just I'm just a cog in in really this this whole wheel of life, whatever you will. And I feel that with other people, and I feel that with the the natural world. And so it's all of a sudden, you know, I could catch myself going, oh, I shouldn't do that. So I'm just as bad as anyone else. But when you are awake, I guess it's like being awake. Mm. And you realize that your action has influence on other things. And the more that you realize that we're all in this together, and that actually my own actions can have an impact very positively, without me even realizing, in the smallest ways, mm -hmm just by being aware and awake. Right. Now, uh, I think you guys are going to be starting a farm as well in Bridgeport, is that right? That's right, an urban farm. An urban farm. What is an urban farm? It's a small farm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's uh, intensive growing uh -huh. in a small amount of space. Okay. Um, this particular site is one and a half, two acres, uh, Reservoir Avenue in Yarmouth. Um, we are about to sign the lease. We have a plan. We are very excited about it. Uh, we're planning on building 120 32 by 4 foot raised beds. Um, okay, the soil so, is so compromised. This is, this is the same uh, uh, idea that you were using at the school garden. So it's, right. it's all raised beds. It's all raised beds. And we would like all of the food to be used in the local community. Mm. Our biggest concern about Bridgeport is is the fact that there is it's really a food desert there's no real fresh food to be had mm -hmm. so what better way than to grow it ourselves right so right. Uh, it, we're very I, I can't tell you this is probably the most exciting thing I've ever worked on so when do you expect to be able to start producing food next year uh, yeah in the spring in the spring and what will you be doing on what kind of foods uh, well <laughs> whatever the community whatever. wants to eat okay <laughs> Uh, we, I mean, we're going to be growing the basic things, but um, we're, we're also looking at the community to say, what, what would you like to eat? What, what would you want to see produced here? And who is the community in this case? Who are you talking to? Um, it, well, the, the whoever the neighbor neighbors are in that community. So it'd just be based on proximity to this to this garden. That's right. People who are there, okay, c couldn't get much more local than that. No, that's, no. we hope that's a model for for anywhere really in the United States to say we could really use, do something with this empty lot. Right. We could turn it into a community garden. Wow. Well, Monique, um, this is really terrific. And uh, you and GBI really do exemplify the idea of local activism, people who see that there's something that needs to be done and go out and do it. Um, and in fact, uh, that's, that's really what's been so amazing. You don't want to sit around and talk about it. You actually want to do it. And um, I, I, I take my hat off to you guys. You've done a terrific job. Um, it's a great model. And I'm, I'm really pleased that you've come. And I'd, I'd love to, maybe we can get together and, uh, when, the, when, the, uh, when your new garden is operating, your new urban farm, and we'll take a look at it. Can't wait to show it to you. I love it. Okay. Thanks so much for All coming right. in. Thanks. And now, a stream of conscience commentary with Kate Tepper. In the past few years, as I've watched the spiraling do dollar signs on the pump when I fill my gas tank and seen the amount of due digits increase on my household energy bills, I thought a great deal about Ben Franklin's adage, a penny saved is a penny earned. Since, over the long term, the price of energy from fossil fuel is almost certain to increase it seemed rather obvious that reducing my energy consumption was the easiest and most cost-effective way to save a lot more than a penny. Whether one believes in climate change or not, everyone can agree that energy efficiency and conservation makes both ecological and economical sense. By evaluating where I was using energy, I found I could easily cut that use without any great sacrifice to my lifestyle. Every statistic shows that even small measures can create big savings. Reducing energy in simple but small ways, like turning off lights or lowering the thermostat a degree or two at night, are an obvious start to an energy saving program. What is not so obvious is the cumulative effect that can be achieved in cost and energy savings, not to mention energy independence, if everyone in the country were to join you in turning that switch off as they leave the room. 
According to Energy Star, a department of the Environmental Protection Agency, if every house in the United States replaced just one incandescent light with a compact fluorescent bulb, it would save enough energy to light more than three million houses in one year. That saving would also reduce the amount of greenhouse gases every energy production releases into the atmosphere. In my own case, over the course of the year, for every degree I lowered my thermostat in the winter or raised it in the summer, I saved 3% on my energy bills. I didn't even feel that two or three degree difference. Indoors, I wore a warmer sweater in the winter and light clothing during the summer. The money I saved enabled me to install a fan above my bed that kept me cool at night without using the air conditioner. I also saved energy and money by slightly lowering the temperature on my water heater and reducing the time I spent in the shower. Something as simple and inexpensive as colored post-it notes on every single energy consuming item, from light switches to computers to water faucets that said, when not in use, turn off the juice, has saved one Long Island school district around $350,000 annually on their utility bills. The program was enthusiastically embraced by janitors, administrators, teachers, and students alike. And with the money saved, the schools were able to purchase better heating and lighting equipment that enabled them to lower their energy bills even further. Start thinking of energy conservation as a major money sa saver. Turn off that TV when no one is watching. Take a few seconds to turn off lights, computers, radios, stereos, and unplug that phone charger promptly. Those little lights that look so pretty on your electronic devices mean that the equipment is draining power all the time and this can increase your energy costs by as much as 10%. You won't just be saving your own money, you will be helping to save our diminishing energy resources and doing your bit to reduce your carbon footprint at the same time. So, when not in use, turn off the juice. Little things really do mean a lot. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you live in the town served by Cablevision from Norwalk, you can catch our show every Wednesday on Channel 88. If you're interested in learning more about progressive political action in Fairfield County, please check out our Democracy for America group. We meet the first Wednesday of the month, 7 to 9 p.m. at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. We always welcome new members. Remember, change is possible and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. We hope to see you again soon.